stretches there, but it's quite a narrow room, wasn't it? Yeah, it's very long and narrow, painted in a rather atrocious shade of brown. <laughs> 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 it, looks, it always looks, if, it, if they were colour, it would have been a very muddy brown. Um, and it does look great in black and white, because my memories of it are always that the walls were, were black, and that's it, whereas he spent a lot more time there than I did. And they were brown, but in the background in that room, I mean, you have to say, it wouldn't have passed any health and safety checks. No, it's, all, no, it's very dangerous, very dangerous. You, you wouldn't uh, get closed down immediately for operating the premises like that. <laughs> and also, the toilet was on another floor, so they could never be bothered oh, no. leaving the room, which is why there are lots of Coke cans and stuff lying <laughs> around. <laughs> <the> yeah. <floor. laughs> Quite dangerous as well, because you couldn't leave them. And then, for some reason, there appears to be a mattress. The mattress is suspended on a piece of string. I can't remember that at all. I don't know what its purpose was. I mean, why would you suspend a mattress on the ceiling? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite scary. <coughs> My fisheries bag on the yeah. ceiling actually did have a purpose, because that was where we hoped it was rain. Some liquid, should we say, some liquid <laughs> seeping through from, from the ceiling upstairs. So instead of trying to get it repaired, they hung a carrier bag underneath <laughs> it to catch all this liquid. We've no idea what it was. But there's a nice picture of it with it above Peter Hook's head while he's sitting on the end of the table. And I often wondered if, if, you know, if he sat there a bit longer, what might have happened. So there was actually a hole in the floor. We, 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 you went further up, you would, would have fallen through the floor. That's where we used to. And there was a toilet as well, which was disconnected from everything, which used to hang. Ah, that's what the piece of string was for. You <laughs> <laughs> used to tie the toilet onto a piece of string. It wasn't connected to anything. And I had to suspend it outside the window and wave it at the bus cocks who were here. <laughs> so maybe we did a similar thing with the mattress. <coughs> you see what passed us humour in the 70s. And the 70s. Yeah. So, well, looking at that, you, it, it's interesting for you because there's not a lot of video of Joy Vision playing. And you're, you, you would never have seen the band live as such. You would have sat behind it. Yeah. and never seen how he performed and what it was like, yeah. the audience up front. So for you, when because when I first shot them, I think Ian was a fairly traditional front man. He had, he had leather trousers, or leatherette trousers, I'm not sure which. And the early Warsaw pictures, where they're wearing uh, PVC caps and so on, was obviously then stolen by Frank who goes to Hollywood about <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. And um, so, you know, New Order was stymied then, they had to go somewhere else. But they, um, when I, I can't remember the first time Ian started the dance, really. It, he was very traditional as a singer, and he'd, dance with, he'd sing with the microphone, he wouldn't move around much, but then suddenly, one <coughs> day, do, can you remember when he started that? Coming animated that way. Yeah. No, I can't. I can remember being shocked though. I can't, I can't, because it, you, you, you're right. You, when he rehearsed the the, 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 the piece, he used to just like everyone just held the mic stand and it was quite static. And then uh, the thing was, we always had little stages, and I quite <coughs> found myself of having more drums than anybody else because of what was that was how you got to be a proper drummer and more drums than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> it just work. But what happened was there wasn't much room for being anyway, and when he did start doing this dance, he just suddenly exploded, and it was like he was coming my way, and all these like quite sharp objects were getting a lot closer to me than they should be every day. Was, oh! <laughs> so I did notice it, because he came that, that way, it caught the attention why he was doing that. And, you know, I mean, it's been documented since the, in Was Epileptic, and again, I don't think, you know, I mean, we, we were all early 20s, and it wasn't something, any illness or anything really, we had not really talk to each other about them. And I wasn't really aware of it, and I spent quite a lot of time with them. And <coughs> was there anything, any way, anybody in the band addressed any of that? Or did you, was it an issue? Because it didn't stop you playing with flashing lights, it didn't stop you doing anything like that. I did, like well I mean, it was, that was the only thing you knew about epilepsy, there were flashing lights. So I, when we went and did the go do for Robbins, I was like, the light was on. Don't oh, flash the lights, right? Don't flash the lights. As though, and uh, for the first time, Ian had a fit, I, pulled over by the side of the road, I can remember burning. 
turn the indicators off. <laughs> <laughs> some photographs as well, certainly the pictures of Ian's notebooks and lyric sheets, you can see a certain anger there with the crossings out and the changes. I mean, everybody, when they're writing an essay or a song or poem or whatever it is, they will cross out and they'll rework and they'll do different drafts. But some of the pages in Ian's notebooks, he's scored through them heavily and then some of them he's written another line upside down on the same page and stuff like that. And when Ian was, I mean, I remember Ian always carried, like Marky Smith actually, he always carried a carrier bag around with him with all this stuff in it. And did you not ever sit and look at Ian's lyrics? No, he's no, just there. Um, it's the only lyricist, singer, whatever, that actually turned up with the work already done. He'd have, he'd have some lyrics and he'd start generally going through get some lyrics out and start singing them. That's like, brilliant, that. <laughs> this, this songwriting is actually a piece of this. It's only later this is going to be able to agonise for days, weeks and months about words. He just thought he, he, he just got hundreds and, and yeah. that was it. Yeah. No, we never looked at them. Yeah. Never looked at them. We wouldn't let you look at them, really. Yeah. And the, the crossings out and stuff was because he, he, he used to really wind, he was one of the easiest people in the world to wind up. <laughs> about anything, he would really, you know, get in the right state about it. And you can tell that, like, right, when you yeah. look at the notebooks, because it starts out quite neat, and right, it must be like three or four o'clock in the morning, it's just, <laughs> well, it doesn't yeah. want you go. <laughs> that's, how he, that's how he was in, like, everything. He would, he would get very, uh, very wound up. And, you know, he used to tease him all the time, you could tell him anything, and he would actually believe that he'd get in, right, really annoyed about it, like at the Stiff Chiswick night, mm. and well, we were all a bit wound up, but Ian, more than anything, was, so yeah, so yeah, was, yeah, he was, yeah, he, he, he would have killed somebody, and it was either me or... It was you or Paul Hall, it was, it was a friend of fire, right, yeah. <laughs> um, a lot like that. Look, yeah. <laughs> it was all because you wanted to go on last, it's a classic rock and roll scenario <laughs> that always happened at rafters, we're going on last. No, we're going on last. Every time we play that. And last, uh, for that Stiff Chiswick Challenge, mm -hmm. um, it, like Paul said, it was, um, it was like a punk version of The X Factor. And Stiff, Chiswick, Stiff and Chiswick Records have got together to put on a series of events for local bands around the country to try and discover new talent. And obviously it was terrible, absolutely terrible. There were 14 bands on that night. All had to play about four or five numbers. We weren't really about uh, the thing with Paul Moy and my band. We you were, weren't a proper band. We weren't. No, we were an avant-garde situation. We, <laughs> <laughs> we just like it. <laughs> you were like them two blokes who went on the singers and they said, "Hey, we're a boy band." Yeah. <laughs> That's what you we were the boy band at the time. You were. And we, we made we we'd sit up all night, Paul and I, making <laughs> stuff up, and we we decided to have a band called the Negatives. Um, which wasn't a difficult thing to come up with, to be honest, being a photographer. And we did, um, we brought, an, we sent a press release out to all the music press to see if they'd print it. And we just said, the Negatives first tour, we picked six venues around Stockport from Paul's Yellow Pages, because he used to live in Heaton Mercy. So we found six venues, the Great Parrot Club, and we thought it was hilarious. And we put all, we sent all this stuff and we printed it. So the next week we sent another press release out saying that the Negative's first EP, Bringing Fiction Back to Music, was coming out and it was going to be deleted the day before it came out. And they thought, brilliant, that's really punk. And they wrote a piece about it. And then we made the mistake, we went on tour 
fallen out. Not not as in touring as a band. Not as a band. No, we went to do a piece with Sham 69 for the NME, and we made the massive mistake of telling Jimmy Percy about our band. And he said, that's great, that's the spirit of punk, I love it. Why don't you support us when we play in Manchester? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, you know, none of us could play, we've not played an instrument, we didn't have anyone else in the band, we had no idea. And we got this guy who, um, who was the only, he was known as Merlin the Magician, he used to wear a belt with Merlin. Good choice, actually. You got <laughs> <laughs> he had a belt. Pull a few things out. Yeah, and he had a belt with Merlin on it. And he was a car mechanic in Stockport. He, he, he worked in the garage next to the bookshop Paul worked in. And we got Richard Boone, Buzzcocks manager, to play sax because he knew someone who had a saxophone. He never actually picked it up, but he knew someone who had one. So we were the only punk band with a saxophone. And we went on stage with Jimmy Kirk <coughs> and Channel 69 at the Oaks in Chorlton. And after about... We, we had two songs, but one, called, one, one was theme from Coronation Street, <laughs> which was Paul tried to pick the theme from Coronation Street out on a bass guitar with three <laughs> strings. And then he'd just shout, theme from Coronation Street, theme from Coronation Street, theme from Coronation Street, and I'd go <laughs> with the drums, and that was it. And then we had another one called Sick of London, which was yeah, obvious, you know, the signal. That was the signal. It was deleted. Yeah. <laughs> so we then decided, we, we just got, we were full of ourselves and we thought we'll do the Stiff Chiswick Challenge. And Paul being Paul did want to go on last and it did cause a lot of trouble. Yeah. And it did kick off in the dressing room. And I remember Hooky having Paul by the throat <coughs> against the door. And in the end, I think we let you go on last. And what, what happened? Yeah, yeah, he did let us go on last. That was yeah, yeah. Part three, nice, nice choice. Part three, more. Getting on for that. three, yes. And uh, when no one was there. Apart from Tony Wilson. No, they were there. There were lots of people there. Lots of people there. We went down better than you did. <laughs> <laughs>